watching the big picture with me Frank Rosen Pereira Iran's foreign minister Mohammad Javad Zarif uh, held talks with his Indian counterpart in the national capital on Tuesday after New Delhi stopped purchases of Iranian oil this month in the wake of renewed US sanctions Zarif who is on a two day visit to India has said that the US is unnecessarily escalating tensions India was Iran's top oil client after China but halted imports after Washington reimposed sanctions on Iran and later withdrew waivers to eight nations including India which had allowed them to import some Iranian oil Washington wants to block Iran's oil exports after US President Donald Trump pulled out of the 2015 accord between Iran and six world powers to curb Tehran's nuclear program the sanctions have more than halved Iran's oil exports to 1 million barrels per day or less from a peak of 2.8 million barrels per day last year according to media reports Iran is insisting on exporting at least 1.5 million barrels per day of oil as a condition for staying in an international nuclear deal on this edition of the big picture we will analyze the way forward for the India Iran bilateral relationship joining me on the program today are Ashok Sajanhar former ambassador professor Harshvi Pant head strategic studies observer research foundation and Major General Dhruv C. Katoch, retired director, India Foundation. Thank you to all my guests for joining me on this edition of The Big Picture. Uh, Ambassador, I'd like to begin the program with you. You know, after the U.S. sanctions kicked in and uh, India stopped importing oil from Iran, what is the status of the bilateral relationship between the two countries, India and Iran? You know, the bilateral relations, uh, of course, are under some stress. Because India has been, as you mentioned, the second largest importer of oil from uh, Iran. But of course, if you look at the totality of the relationship, our relations between India and Iran are truly historical, are truly civilizational, are truly cultural, whether in the field of art, music, cuisine, uh, culture, architecture. You know, there's a very long history that binds the two countries together. And uh, if we are looking also in the current day scenario, uh, energy security is of course a very important element of our bilateral relationship. But in addition to that, there are also many other strands. For instance, India has been engaged in Chabahar for a long time now. Uh, we started working on it in 2003, but of course uh, after the JCPOA was signed in 2015, then that uh, has uh, uh, caught pace. Because when Prime Minister Modi visited uh, Iran in the middle of 2016, that was the time when uh, also the president of Afghanistan, Ashraf Ghani, he was also invited and a trilateral deal was signed basically on expansion and on renovation of Chabahar. And that was done from May 2016 when the Prime Minister visited till December 2017. In one and a half years, the capacity of the uh, Shahid Bahishti uh, seaport Phase 1 was expanded from 2.5 million tons to 8.5 million tons. So that has started working. We have started exporting uh, uh, wheat and other commodities to Afghanistan using that. And of course, it is uh, very important because it also gives us an access to Central Asia. And from Central Asia to Russia and to Europe because we are not allowed access uh, through Pakistan. So this is a very strategic asset as far as India is concerned. And of course, it makes a great sense as far as Iran is also concerned because it uh, provides it, uh, it with an access also and uh, possibility of reaching out to Russia and uh, to other countries. Uh, the International North-South Transport Corridor also on which discussions have been going on for a long time. So that also has been... Uh, taken up and much more work has been done that also started at the end of the 1990s but right. again it took uh, speed uh, only over the last three four years so that's also very important it takes uh, from India from Mumbai or Kandla to Bandar Abbas and from there to Azerbaijan Baku and very recently one particular 150 kilometer long railway link from Kazvin to Rasht that was missing that has also been inaugurated so you know it provides full connectivity from Bandar Abbas to Astrakhan uh, to Baku in Azerbaijan Astrakhan and then beyond to Russia and to so these are important uh, 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 elements then if we look at uh, the situation in Afghanistan there also Iran uh, is an important partner because like India Iran also wants that uh, there should be the peace and reconciliation process that has been going on, it should be an Afghan-owned, 
Afghan controlled uh, process there and uh, both India and Iran and also Russia in the 1990s we have we were supportive of the Northern Alliance right. against the Taliban but uh, today we find that uh, both uh, Russia and Iran are uh, uh, looking at having cutting some sort of a deal for the entirely their own reasons but uh, definitely they want uh, uh, a peaceful solution quick <coughs> solution which is uh, maybe Taliban also becomes a part of that but the interests are similar right and in addition to that of course there are a large number of other areas on which we can cooperate when the Iranian president came here last year in uh, February 2018 then also we try to take the relationship forward sure. so barring the oil element because of the uh, because US sanctions, US <coughs> sanctions but there also there are some ways that are being discussed as to how to skirt it and how to get around it right right that having been said <coughs> general I'd like to bring you into the picture yeah, now you know uh, waiver as far as Chabahar is concerned but no waiver on oil as far as the US sanctions are concerned why is that so do you think well you see Chabahar is important to the Americans also oh. because uh, as the ambassador very rightly pointed out now that is providing you the link to Afghanistan and uh, I think when you're looking at the American interests in Afghanistan they are also looking at a situation sometime not far in the future by which you can actually sideline Pakistan now uh, while the Americans may have their differences with Pakistan with the, the Iranians today it is not necessary that they will have such differences tomorrow so putting a stop on Chabahar is certainly not in the long-term interest of the United States right uh, if you actually stop it uh, I think and you come on to say three years down the line onto a peace treatment or, or on a better terms of engagement with Iran then I think they will rue the fact that they actually had um, uh, 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 put a stopper onto Chabahar so having said that that is one point I think the second thing is that um, the Americans are looking for a quick getaway now from Afghanistan I really don't know how that is going to happen because uh, while uh, you know Ambassador Zajanar very rightly said that um, uh, the Chinese and the, uh, the Chinese and the Russians too have their interests including the Iranians but if you want to get the Taliban on board there is no way in which you can get the Taliban on board along with the present government it is either one or the other mm. right so uh, uh, the the uh, the thought process that you can get both on board and both can run the government together I think it is a pipe dream it is not going to happen perhaps the better course would be to ensure that the present government in Afghanistan becomes a strong government and is in a position to take on the Taliban on its own with some sort of external support from the Western powers including the United States that that in my view would appear to be a better option uh, if that option also has to be exercised and you don't want Pakistan to be in the picture because Pakistan is very firmly behind the Taliban then again the Chabahar uh, port becomes very important because that is your only route which can actually put in uh, resources into Afghanistan so that that is I think that is why the Americans are looking at it uh, um, uh, looking at Chabar in a slightly different way as far as the uh, oil is concerned uh, you see oil is something which is giving revenue to Iran if they choke Iranian revenue I think they'll be in a position to force them to come to the negotiating table and I think that is where the danger lies as to how far will the Americans go and how far will, uh, and how much can the Iranians take mm. uh, are the Americans only looking for an for a regime change or are they looking for something more and what exactly or how exactly will the Revolutionary Guards operate and what will the Iranian government do I think there are many question marks still in, in this equation but if it leads to conflict then I'm afraid that the uh, situation especially for India is going to be catastrophic absolutely we'll talk about uh, you know the way forward really as far as India and Iran are concerned but before that uh, professor a thought on really the economic uh, implications on Iran really after the US sanctions have kicked in and can they can they survive at this uh, I think uh, the you know all the data that has coming out of that has come out of Iran in the last few months is uh, points to a very grim picture as far as the Iranians are concerned and the uh, and the, the sanctions this time are particularly problematic because I think they are specifically targeted also so you do you, uh, Americans have not only looked at the uh, range of sanctions which were to cripple the Iranian economy 
But also one of the arguments that Americans have made is that resources should not go to, for example, the Revolutionary Guards, and so they are targeting their assets as well. So I think at some point, uh, you know, the, the expectation, which is a traditional uh, sort of uh, an understanding that perhaps as the Iranian economy would crumble, you would have an insider revolution that, that might top topple the regime on, on its own. You don't have to work, uh, you know, work your way around it uh, militarily. Uh, but that can also go, I, I, you know, the, the other way. If you, if you, uh, you know, screw, uh, tighten the screws uh, more, then perhaps the rally around the flag effect happens, and so the Iranian regime may become more secure. So it, there is an argument both sides. But what is interesting, I think, is that uh, at, at this point, uh, what is also happening in the in terms of the larger regional environment, where you have just uh, over the weekend tanker attacks happened. Now we we don't know who who did that. Investigations are still going on. But if that sort of a problem escalates, then there is an issue not simply about states of Hormuz, for example, but also about the larger regional uh, sort of uh, energy supplies. And this, this affects not simply the region itself, but also the partners of the region, including India, including China, including other major powers that, uh, that are beholden to the region for en energy security. So I think what we are now looking at is a problem that was largely about Iran uh, and to sort of cripple the Iranian economy. <coughs> now being escalated or now becoming a potential flashpoint in the larger regional landscape. So the larger regional, uh, get, the region gets embroiled in this uh, binary between US uh, and, uh, and, and the Iranians. Of course, the Arab Gulf states have always had uh, you know, a different understanding and they have always sided with, the, with Washington on this crisis. So there is a larger regional chessboard also right. along Absolutely. with Israel that is, that is being shaped up. So I think that the, the point, uh, you know, if you look at the, at the data, uh, which, is, which is very similar to the data that we have seen in the past as well. Iranians have been through this a number of times and there has been an extreme degree of resiliency in the Iranian, Iranian regime yeah. that we have seen in the past as well. So it's not entirely evident that if you keep on tightening the screws in and of themselves there is going to be a, a, a political change in the country, which I think many are expecting. But you also hear stories that Americans are preparing for a, a show of force. They have already uh, sent a few of their bombers and uh, Patriot missiles there. Uh, along with the aircraft carriers. There is also a report that their new military plans are being envisioned. So I think they are working on multiple fronts. The problem, of course, as has as been pointed out, it can, is, is, it, what, what happens if there is an accident? Sure. Uh, in, in inadvertent uh, escalation of the crisis. If, because Iranians also are, at least at this point, saber-rattling. They are also saying that, look, we are also preparing ourselves militarily. We are also preparing ourselves politically. I think uh, the visit of the, uh, of the Iranian foreign minister to India is a step in that direction, rallying, sure. uh, rallying the world community around Sure, absolutely. Talks. So, you know, the developments over the weekend, like pointed out by the professor ambassador, are quite alarming in nature. I mean, at the end of the day, we do not want anything to happen there in the Strait of Hormuz. But is the situation likely to worsen, do you think, with all this saber rattling that the professor was talking about going on, with the U.S. moving its uh, you know, aircraft carrier, Abraham Lincoln, and so on and so forth? Uh, well, there are possibilities, you know, because uh, this is a brinkmanship, really in the classical sense, being played by both the sides. But, uh, uh, you know, if we look at it as to what is it that the United States is uh, aiming for, what is its objective? And as has been mentioned by Harsh, I think it is definitely, you know, either of the two situations it could be. One, a regime change, although, you know, wherever regime changes have taken place, the United States should have realized, you know, starting from Iraq to Libya to uh, 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 Egypt or to other places, nowhere has a regime change in that sense been successful to have brought in a regime that is more friendly towards the United States. So even if, uh, you know, Mr. Rouhani goes out, then what could be expected is a more hardline regime, you know, because we have seen also in the very recent past that when the uh, Mr. Rouhani came uh, back, you know, won the election in 2016 on the basis of the fact that 2015 JCPOA had signed, so sanctions will be removed and the living conditions of the people will improve. That did not happen. So in 2017, we had seen all these uh, protests and demonstrations and even uh, these uh, demonstrations by young women sort of, you know, taking off their rusari and... Uh, uh, you know, something that is considered to be quite uh, sacrilegious as far as the Iranian uh, system today is concerned. And of course, there were bread riots and uh, because things were not available. So I think this seems to have given some sort of uh, uh, indication or hope to the Americans that, uh, you know, if the sanctions are reimposed again, they are uh, uh, pushed to the wall. 
then there will be again protest demonstrations and Rouhani might have to leave. The other is like it happened in the case of North Korea that if you apply the sanctions they will be forced to come to the negotiating table and as Mr. Trump has said you know it's not only the nuclear uh, program but it's also the missile program that he wants to bring in and it's also wants to uh, cover the so-called terrorist activities of the Iranian government, you know, Hamas in Gaza and uh, uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon and so on and so forth. So uh, the, these are the objectives that it is, right. uh, it is trying to get. But it might really not be able to get any of this. And uh, uh, of course, uh, Israel is very happy at whatever is happening. Israel would be happy to launch preemptive strikes at uh, Iranian... Uh, uh, establishments, uh, you know, whatever is known about the nuclear establishment. So it could, anything could really happen either uh, intentionally or uh, unintentionally. unintentionally, accidentally. Sure. And then it is not going to be limited only to these two countries, but it's going to be a much bigger uh, There's definitely affair. going to be a spillover to the other countries as yes. well. Yeah, so yes. the situation is extremely volatile at this point in time is what you're suggesting. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. General, let me bring you into the picture then. So mm -hmm. what happens to the nuclear deal. Let's not forget that the Americans <coughs> unilaterally pulled out of this nuclear deal. The others are still part of it. Europeans are with the Iranians. There's also China who is backing uh, Iran at this point in time. You see, this um, nuclear deal was, uh, I mean, this entire, uh, uh, the, the plan of action which they had done, the, um, the joint plan of action, it was supposed to be there for 10 years. That means um, it started in 2015 and by 2025, it was supposed to, com uh, uh, supposed to be completed. And um, there were certain controls placed on various aspects of uh, Iran's nuclear program. Now, as of now, the Iranians have said that they will also be pulling out, but they have taken no action. Mm. But I think at some point of time, something has to give. You see, uh, I am not very certain if uh, Iran would like to go through um, and stand up for nuclear power uh, or, or to make nuclear weapons. Uh, that is something which I think is not even in India's interest. Uh, we do not want a nuclear weapon Iran. I think that, that, that one point is quite clear. At the same time, we don't want the issue to go out of control. So can India actually, uh, India actually play a mediatory uh, role between uh, the Americans and the Iranians on this particular issue? I'm not really sure as to how far that can go because uh, <clears throat> I think Iran is very, very self-centered. On the, You know, it's a question of national prestige now. And once it comes to national prestige, then I think all other considerations are generally, um, when you're looking at the larger strategic picture, once the nation comes in and your self-pride or something comes in, then people really don't care about the consequences. And I think that is where the larger danger lies. This, this nuclear program is a problem. And I think it will be uh, wise on the part of both the United States and Iran to work their way around it. The other problems can be handled, you know, like when we are talking about their support to uh, the terrorist function, the Hamas. That is really Israel's concern, but I think that can be handled. This is something which Israel is very, very sensitive about. Right. Their missile program and their nuclear program. And uh, for the Israelis, they look at it as life-threatening uh, life because they feel that this country can actually do it. Mm. Uh, Pakistan has also got nuclear weapons, but I think Israel is reasonably certain that Pakistan is not going to uh, harm, them, uh, harm them in that way, in which Israel will. Uh, in, uh, which Iran pun, will. in which Iran will. Because you see, the problem is that the Iranian leadership has time and again made such statements wherein they have said that they will destroy Israel. Mm. Now, when you look at it from the Israeli point of view, they say, and I've spoken to quite a few people in their hierarchy in Israel, uh, they say that if the Iranians say they are going to destroy us, it will be foolish on our part not to believe them. Mm. So I think there, is, there has to be some sort of a pullback from the Iranian side also in terms of giving out positive vibes to say that these nuclear weapons or, or whatever our facilities are will never be used against Israel sure. or something like that. I mean, sure. you've got to change the dialogue. So this is one part. A little bit of give and take. Yes. But the second thing, I think, which is some, certainly more, uh, more dangerous, which uh, Professor Hurst just, just brought out, you see, the damage which was caused to these four tankers yesterday. Hmm. Um, I think it took place yesterday or day before yesterday. Um, uh, now, this took place off the coast of Fujairah, you know, and I think it is very significant because out of the four tankers, Two of them were destined to, uh, to carry oil for the United States. Right. Right. They, that means they were going in for the carriage, and that is the time when this damage took place. One is the Norwegian, and the fourth one, I'm not really sure um, that those details haven't come out. 
But I think this points to Iran has denied any hand in it and Saudi Arabia has also not accused Iran. So to, up to now, uh, we are at a status quo as position. But we really don't know who has done it. And has this been done actually to create friction between the United States and Iran? Now, we really don't know that because right. regardless of what can happen, a third country can really come in to play the spoiler between the two and make them fight. Absolutely. And my biggest fear is that should a, 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 should a, should a, a conflict erupt in this region, I think the only option as far as the revolutionary guards are concerned is they will close the straits. Right. And if they close the straits, then you see the Indian oil supply, you know, when we're talking of oil from Iran, as it is, we have stopped it. The oil from Kuwait, the oil from Iraq, all that becomes problematic. Sure. It won't really be a problem to Saudi Arabia. It is not a problem to the United States. Right. They are not importing any oil from here. They are self-sufficient. Yeah. But I think it's going to be very serious. The most, uh, the country most like uh, most affected will be India. And I think we should actually uh, try to, avoid, to try to put in uh, all diplomatic efforts to see that the region remains stable. Sure. Let's talk about India now, Professor. You know. Uh, <clears throat> Jawad Zarif is in India even as we speak at this point in time. So how do we take the bilateral relationship forward? What are our options really? Well, partly I think uh, as has been explained, uh, there is a real issue here in terms of uh, the, the very immediate crisis that is brewing in the region and, uh, and the costs that will, it, it will <coughs> impose on India if this bilateral issue between US and America becomes a larger regional issue. And here, uh, you know, we are, we, are, we are not simply talking of uh, big players. We are talking of Saudis, we are talking of the Israelis, we are talking of UAE, all of them coming into play and basically, um, uh, you know, shattering India's energy security. So there are huge issues as far as India is concerned on the table. And one would hope that some of this, uh, you know, concern uh, would be conveyed to the, to the Iranians themselves because Iranians also have been making a lot of very provocative noises. Uh, especially when they, you know, when you talk of a bilateral irritant and you give it a regional shape. So the moment you say we will close the Straits of Hormuz, which they have threatened, uh, it becomes a larger problem. Now, from their perspective, perhaps you can understand it, that they don't have much uh, any other uh, leverage, so they are using it in, in terms of saber rattling. But I think the message it conveys to the rest of the world is, is that you are taking a bilateral problem and you are then imposing it even on, on countries like India, which have been traditional friends. So I think there is an issue here which needs to be conveyed very categorically to the Iranians that this would be unacceptable if this happens. Similarly, I think given that uh, India has very strong ties with the US, uh, the question is what India can do to leverage those ties in articulating a more responsible uh, regional framework. I think what is interesting here if, if you have seen is that there is a sense uh, of despondency in Iran as far as the international community is concerned. They initially thought that the European Union would play a very important role in articulating a response to American withdrawal from JCPOA. Mm. And so far, Iranian, European Union has come to not. They have not given any singular uh, feature uh, which perhaps can uh, alleviate some of these concerns. They have not come out with an alternative mechanism of payment, which, one of the, which was one of the demands of, of Iranians. And I think now they have given the European Union two months to say that you do something in two months. Uh, otherwise, we, we are just moving out of the, of the JCPOA. So I think there is that despondency that is setting in. And also what is interesting is China's role. Right. Uh, because, see, we are still a small player as far as Iran is concerned. China is a huge player. But if you look at China's voice, they have not said much. Mm. And you can understand that. They are having a trade negotiation with, yeah. the, with Washington. So there is a separate track there. And I think unless Chinese speak up, you don't see the, you know, the, the rallying effect not, is not going to happen in the region. So I think, in a way... Uh, Washington has played its cards very well, that they have escalated this question at a time when they hold cards vis-a-vis -vis the Chinese, who are perhaps the most important player today in the Middle East. Right. So I think India's role becomes important because India is away from this. India can certainly take a more, dis a more dispassionate view of these uh, de developments and as friends of both US and Iran, mm. perhaps mm. can play a more, a more significant role if the crisis escalates. Yeah. Uh, closing comments now from all my guests on that very line itself, Ambassador. So is it a tough tightrope walk for uh, India going forward? It is indeed a tough uh, tightrope walk and I think uh, India's diplomacy is going to be tested to the full. We'll have to be sort of uh, both uh, subtle and also quick and nimble-footed because, you know, in addition to the uh, energy security in terms of, you know, getting uh, Iranian oil, which our refineries need, even if the Iranian oil was not coming, we would be able to meet uh, that uh, shortcoming because, you know, the United States has said that it would be able to 
send its oil and some of our refineries which use Iranian oil can uh, use Saudi oil, can use Kuwaiti oil, can use uh, oil from UAE also. So in terms of uh, uh, importing Iranian oil, it's not that much of a problem. But pricing is a huge problem mm. because Iran is giving us uh, much better terms, much better conditions, both in terms of uh, payment for the oil as also in terms of <coughs> the shipment and the insurance. So uh, that is something that uh, we need because uh, it is at a very uh, competitive price. And if you are getting it from some other sources, then that price is not all that competitive as we are getting it from Iran. So I think this is also a point that has to be brought forward, that has to be made to our other interlocutors as far as the United States is concerned from where, you know, they expect that, uh, uh, you know, the uh, oil price has to play a very significant role as far as India's economic development growth is concerned, as also as far as uh, uh, our social stability is concerned. Because right. if you are getting it, uh, you know, as we are discussing, hypothetically, Straits of Hormuz does get closed or something, our uh, prices here are going to skyrocket. skyrocket yeah. And that is going to be very, very difficult, uh, not only economically, but also politically and socially for India. So we are in a difficult situation and we have to right. sort of, you know, continue our channels of communication, both the United States, to extend our waiver in whatever way it is possible mm. with Iran and also to see whether from the high seas, if Iran is able to get its oil on the high seas, right. whether we might be able to lift it off the high seas again at competitive prices. Sure. Uh, General, <coughs> so what does the Iranian foreign minister's visit to India tell us? I think uh, the Iranians are concerned and so is India because um, amongst all the countries mm -hmm. here which are going to be uh, impacted, I think India is going to be the worst hit. This is hitting out, it is not simply the question of oil. Um, uh, the ambassador has said the oil will cost more. We can, we can afford that cost. So I don't think it is the cost really matters, so long as the oil keeps coming. Now what happens if the oil stops coming? You see, that is, the, that is the challenge. The challenge is not that the oil supply is coming. The, ch the challenge is if the oil supply stops because something happens in the Straits. The second part of it is that we have got a very large number of Indians working in the Gulf uh, and the remittances are, are something like 50 to 60 billion dollars per year. That accounts for 3% of our GDP. Now, if those remittances stop, then we get a double whammy. So I think we are looking at a very, very serious situation for India. I think Indian diplomacy has to be at its very best. I'm absolutely delighted that the elections are about to be over so that people can actually start devoting attention to this crisis which is looming. This is going to be the first and the most important crisis which has to be handled by the next government. Mm. And I think they would have to get down to it immediately. Sure. And Professor, close the show for us with your concluding remarks. Well, uh, clearly, as, as I think the two panelists have pointed out, there is, a, there is an immediate problem. If there is a crisis, what do you do with your energy security? What do you do if the states are closed and, and what are your options? I think, you know, apart from that, Indian foreign policy would be tested because so, so long there, is an, there has been an assumption that, look, we have been very, very good, nimble in Middle East. It has been the high point of Indian diplomacy. We have managed our relations with the Arab Gulf states, with Israel, with Iran, all at the same time. I think now, uh, as the situation becomes problematic, it would be very interesting to see how this uh, cookie crumbles as far as India, Indian foreign policy is concerned, because India will have to make choices, and India will have to stand with, with one side or the other, because this is a very complex uh, you know, game that is being played out. And if the crisis escalates, then you can see the Arab Gulf states, Israel and America standing on one side and Iran on the other. I think it would be very interesting to see what India does. Absolutely. It will be interesting to see what happens really and probably one of the uh, toughest challenges that the next government will have to take on as soon as it comes to power. That's what the panelists at least here are suggesting. With that, it's a wrap on this edition of The Big Picture. Thank you to all my guests for joining me on the program and putting things into perspective for us. That's it from me. See you again next time.